Right then, this is a bit of a different setup, um, but I uh, just thought we'll do something different. We're going to do this whole thing differently, actually. So this is a video about the D cycle engine, as you can see up there. I'm going to do multiple things in this video, or let me say, multiple different views. So we're going to do a bit of this. Um, I'm going to do a bit of me drawing badly, that kind of thing. Um, but we're going to go through this engine design. So this is what a couple of, I say a couple, maybe 40, 50 people, messages on Facebook usually, a few links in the messages on, um, comments in videos and so on. And I did put up a post about a month ago asking for this exact thing. Not this particular engine, uh, so I'm going to put it in a video right now. There are videos on YouTube um, of engine designs. Now I'm not talking about Duke, you know, they've got a big they're actually trying to make real engines and stuff like that. I mean designs. So you'll find videos on YouTube of that are entitled New Engine Design and it'll be some weird wobbly thing or whatever. And if this format I'm trying to do now works really well, we're gonna, you know, go through it. Um it is the end of the day, I've been at work all day, so forgive me if I make some little fuck ups. It's just the nature of the beast. I've got to try and fit these videos in somewhere. So, without me whinging about fucking what I'm doing, let's get on with it. The one thing we're going to do different in this video is I'm going to, to make it a bit more interesting, I'm going to play this video through and I'm going to show you what I do and what I see first. So a lot of people say, you know, how do you know or how do you work out if it's good or bad and how do you notice these things? So we're going to go through it. So let's just pretend in a sense we're going to rerun what happened. Someone sent me the links. I've done a load of digging and stuff like that. But we're going to go through it all. So let's just play it and then let's just see what happens. So the first thing I do is I like to run through it so i'm going to blow this up so you can just watch the video um but the first thing i just, I just like to look and go oh shiny so this is a quite a lot of good information is this especially this bit because it gives us information that you would have to calculate but they're just telling us it instead um so yeah that's all good four strokes every revolution 20 percent less fuel power exhaust intake compression so the power exhaust intake compression that is the auto cycle, and then it's just going through it. So immediately, what can we see? Well, we can see there's a crank. Let me just zoom you in. <laughs> right then, so let's see. Is that that's all right? Uh, is it? I've got a bit of porky porky. Something to point with. Uh, nothing brilliant. I just want something that contrasts, and I don't have anything. That'll just, uh, it'll do. Right, so, obviously we've got a conrod, we've got a crankshaft, or a section of a crankshaft, and we've got all this gubbins. So what I want to do is just pause it there. Crankshaft there, conrod, piston, wrist pin, top of a piston, this weird big arm, we've got a roller bearing there, even with an E-clip, oh, very nice camshaft here basically it is a cam so you call it a camshaft and what's missing from this design is above at the top there is two camshafts or a camshaft and a regular four stroke head design so just an intake valve exhaust regardless of the numbers it's the same thing i've actually looked at the patent for this as well um so you, your main things is you've got two separate pistons You've got a rod that's split into, it's not split into two, it looks like one complete rod, but it's got two um, main beams to the rod. So it's got two main beams with one major cap. It's kind of, it's, it's like a fork rod, but not, they go straight up. And for a, re a good reason. Um, a camshaft and a bearing. And if we actually look, one of the first things I want to do is get in my mind exactly what, how everything's working. So looking at it, the camshaft and the crank are rotating at the same speed, but they are, you know, basically geared. So they're alternate on alternate rotations. You don't have to have it that way. You just reverse the cam, but any road. And then this is obviously just like a cam follower. 
you've also got this rod that's attached to this piston and a pivot there. Now if you watch, you'll see this rod move, rotate. It doesn't just nod at the bottom, it has to nod at the top as well, which is important. So in other words, this is the wrist pin for these rods, but this rod here must have a wrist pin itself as well, like a, well, just like a mini version. So you can see there that this rod is articulating there, you can see it bend there. So as it pushes up, you'll see it in slow motion a lot better. There. This is bending out, so there must be a pivot up here because we don't see the pivot, the, this piston crown rock, so we must have that there. And the rest of it, you know, when you look at it, it's self-explanatory. So what it's doing is, we'll get to it when it gets around to that slow motion bit. So we've got an intake, or sorry, a power stroke, fucking intake, power stroke there. So the massive increase in temperature in the combustion chamber and then the, the resulting increase in pressure is forcing that piston down. And that piston is transferring um, the force from, this, from the crown into the piston, the main piston that's attached to the crankshaft. And that we, we get 120 degrees of rotation there. Then what happens is, is due to the momentum of the, this, the, the under piston or the, the bulk piston, the main piston, the crank piston, it carries on travelling you know, traveling around because of the momentum of the crankshaft and this rocker here with this roller at uh, this cam and this rocker arm and this uh, follower is now being lifted up as you can see from 120 to 200 and something. There we go, 200 degrees, 200, oh fucking hell, there we go. So we've got, it forces it so down and it forces it up that's the exhaust, so we've spent, there's our power stroke, the exhaust gases are there, it then forces them out. So we have to have an intake and an exhaust valve open with the duration of this system. I know you can't see my face that much, but you don't really need to do it. Um, and then on the way back down, you've got an intake, so it's intaking, and then what happens is, as the intake comes down, our piston, our main piston is coming back up and basically carries it with it, like so. And then you'll get compression and a boom again, and it just repeats the whole process. You'll also notice as well, and this is what you should do with stuff like this. Forget everything else, forget making your mind up about things, forget all that rubbish. You just look at what you've got, right? This carrier arm here is just to hold it, all this could all be inside a block and stuff like that. You can see that you've got this big slice in here. Basically, it's a hollow, an elongated hollow, for this rod, this articulated rod, to basically move within within it, you know, without clouting anything, stuff like that. You also see that there's a lot of... It's, it's hollow. They're trying to make this piston as light as possible. One thing you have to do take into consideration is that all the forces that go through this piston have to go through this surface, this contact surface. And we just move on in the same thing, rocking up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Right, so, now we've got all that, let's have a look at some of our issues. I Basically, I'd literally just sat here, Mrs was sat here, doing play on the phone or whatever, and I was just watching it, she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just repeatedly watching it, master pull out, there we go, just basically repeatedly watching it and just breaking each section down. So I've wrote them down, what they are, you don't want to see much on there. I did a few little sketches and stuff like that. So number one is the mini wrist pins. So this piston, this rod is running through the center of it, it can't have a through wrist pin, which means it has to have one either side, which means it has to have two mini wrist pins. And they have to be stopped from moving, retained from moving, inwards and outwards, outboard or inboard from this location. So you're adding clips in and stuff like that. The fact of the matter is you're getting a wrist pin and splitting it into two, it's not any heavier. But the clips, you're adding a bit more in there. It's just now getting a bit funny, fiddly. You'd have to insert the, the sir clips through this skinny gap, however big that is, so this restricts, in a sense, the size of it. 
Unless you'd have a machine stop inside out of aluminium. Ooh, I don't like the idea of that. So that's number one. And like I said, I'm just systematically looking at all these, you know, there's no, this is the worst, this is the, the easiest problem. These are just problems. So the next thing actually is this um, articulation point up here. Again, you're going to need another two gudgeons, so they're the bosses, and then a hole going through, and then this pin. Now it's either really thin, but then you've got to transfer some forces through that. It's not all of the forces, because all the forces should actually be transferred through the piston when it comes to the power stroke. But it's still, it's hidden here. We've even got a dip like a, a, a two-stroke diesel. Well, that's, that's impossible. It's just for drawing's sake, you know, this could be just for demonstration's sake. But having that pin in there, eh, it's it needs also to be oiled, and this all, it messes a lot of things up. So the other thing I put was, um, so the other thing is the rocking moment. So what's going to happen is, is that as this piston, this, the crown in a sense, as it goes up, it is on a pivot, right? And there is no skirts to this. There are no skirts. Now you could put skirts on the side of it that then, uh, it gets a bit, it could slide in between there. You could cut this a centre section out and just have a, you could do that, right? That, just because you see a problem doesn't mean that problem can't be solved. But as it is right now, you just the the, the piston crown is just going to rock. It's just going to turn like that. It's just going to fuck up, and it's going to fuck up with the natural motion of things just going up and down and reciprocating the pulling and the pushing and pulling. You're just going to make it do this. It's going to slap all over the place and just basically skid, flop around, bang it. There, it's going to get stuck. Uh, one of the other problems that you can see straight there, we're going to stick at the top here. This is why I moved down, starting at the piston. One of the big problems is, is that I'll show you, um, where is it? So here, from here on in, this piston is on its way up. This piston is on its way down. So the crown is on its way down. This piston itself is on its way up. It's all got to be timed very gracefully and there can be no real wiggle room and you've got to be careful of uh, slight thermal expansion and stuff like that because when these two clap together if we look at how they clap together the piston the main bolt piston is now getting a move on right she's what 45 degrees after bottom dead center it's going to start to accelerate and when it does that that clap of one coming down the other one coming that is <laughs> When you start going 5,000 RPM and stuff, it's a lot of force. And that force is kind of mitigated in a sense to a degree because this rod, an articulated rod here, is actually sat on top of the cam. So if it was forced up, jerked up, it, you know, if this was jerked up by this piston carrying it, like hitting it and carrying it up, it's not the end of the world because there's nothing mechanically restraining you there which we'll get to that in a minute. Thermal expansion is um, one of the things that's actually dealt with in this because this gap might nip up, but like I said, this is free to move out. If you put this roller on top and the cam on top of that, then you'd have some thermal expansion problems because as everything expands, you'd be wanting it to move in a way that would pull it against the cam instead of away from it. Um, so really not the end of the world. So it's basically, like I said, 270 degrees, then two, this one's moving, the crown's moving down, this one's moving up, and slap. Um, so, one of, let's have a look at some of the other problems. One of the big problems I have when I looked at this um, is the intake. So when we play it through, actually, just give me a second. Right then, so what I've done is I've slowed it right down, as you can see. Um, so this bit where I want to talk about is the intake. So what happens is, is that you have your power stroke. All good, we're going through the motions. And then there we go, great. The cam follower stops it, the bottom piston carries on descending. Then we get the exhaust. So now the cam here starts to push against this rocker and then push this back up, pushes the exhaust up. Now this is the point. 
So there. So what we are here is we're at the very end of our roller. So this is that this like a valve. This is maximum lift. And we're at the top of the exhaust, right? Now, when we do an intake stroke, the piston in a regular engine is meant is meant to come down, create a volume, and then the fresh air outside and the fuel in the ports and obviously gets sucked in. Sucked in, sucked in being the optimum word word here, as it's not right. It's not sucked in. So I should be able to yeah show you this. So what we've got is we've got a cylinder. like this. So you can see that. And then let's put our valves in just crudely. So we've got an intake valve here, an exhaust valve here. All is good. Now, what we're meant to do is we are meant to pull the piston down like so, if you can see that. That red's not coming out very well, is it? Because the yellow light. So we're meant to come down like this and create a volume in here, right? To entice the air outside. So in a sense, we're, we're sucking in a crudish term. We're creating a volume. The fact of the matter is, is how? You see, when this rolls round, the piston is going to fall over at gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. That's the acceler acceleration of gravity. gravity. But piston speeds, you, you'll hear averages of, you know, 30 meters per second and stuff like that. And the accelerations um, are going to basically beat that. The, some of the accelerations of uh, the air flowing through the ports will beat this beat this acceleration, beat this speed. Um, because this is 9.8 meters per second, you make that a tenth of a second, and that's 0.98 and uh, hundredths of a second. You know, you're getting, it's not very fast. And when you get up to like 5,000 RPM, if for a case of a bike engine, 10,000 RPM, stuff like that, you're gonna basically get valve float where the cam has swung round, this thing's fallen under gravity, any air pressure in this crankcase is going to resist you doing that. Because that's the thing, right? Let's just say the uh, pressure in this crankcase, right? If Especially if it's got a breather to it, it could be 0.8 atmospheres, right? It could be lower, but let's just say it's 0.8. And if this is 0.8 atmospheres, right, uh, atmospheres, if this is 0.8 in here because of your exhaust gases that you just haven't quite purged out, then it's not going to, it's going to, you're going to get this gridlock system. As soon as you drop a bit, even if it's higher pressure because of the remaining exhaust gases, as soon as you drop a bit, you're going to lower that pressure and you're going to get an equilibrium. So what's going to happen is it's only gravity that's going to fucking help you in this, which at these at higher speeds won't be enough. Now, that's the thing. What you could do, and probably what's in the system is, in here somewhere, there's a torsional spring, just like the Ducati system, um, you know, where you have a spring that's like this, you know, just a, a torsional spring, and that pulls it down. But again... You've now got a heavy mass. It's going to have to be a heavy spring to keep up with these speeds, and you're going to, you know, you're getting into valve flow. And the other thing as well is every time that piston try, every time this cam goes against that spring, you're going to have to go against the spring force at pivotal moments, so on and so forth. It's just you might look at it and go, well, it's obvious. Look, it, it just falls in slow motion. So there, the intake, you see? The cam turns round. Can we speed this up a bit? Okay, I'll be here all year. Oh, fucking jumps, you bastard. Technology, you see? 
No fucking good. No, not compression. Intake. Power intake. Come on. It doesn't like going slow motion. There we go. There we go. So here. Do the intake. Unless there's a spring, that's just gravity following this cam profile, that neat cam profile. It works great in bloody when you're doing SOLIDWORKS models or CGI, whatever you want to do, it works great in this because you're telling this roller just to follow that profile. But in reality, it doesn't mean that that's going to happen. Now, there was some people in the comments who did say stuff like um, the acceleration of this piston, this crown. So if I speed this up to normal speed, there we go. So the acceleration here, right? So it goes down that acceleration there, back down again. Now, if this, I haven't done the calculations, you can't just say, oh, it can't handle it. We don't know the strength of these pivots, which is basically where the weakness is. And I don't know the weight of this crown. So in part two, because there will be a part two, there always is because people ask questions. I'm going to use an example, like a piston out of an R1 or something, and use all the measurements for that, and basically just make a crown and accelerate it with this kind of profile you know that kind of profile there because i can split this up because it comes out of the degree wheel i can work out the times for varying rpm so i'll do that um there's one other question uh there are some things that these pivots seem a bit anemic and so on this rod is double the weight it's quite heavy so on and so forth one thing i will uh, one thing i do want to say is this bit that's coming up right now and it's really important this bit 20 percent less fuel now a lot of these uh, companies that come out with new engines always turn around and say oh it creates less you know 50 40 percent less emissions 30 percent less fuel but double the power or something stupid you know what i mean there's a reason why it's 20%, and the guy's not wrong. We'll get to the guy in a second. He's not wrong, um, but when you see why, you'll go, well, duh. So what's happening is, when we look at, we'll get to the degree wheel bit, because that's basically just describes it in the best way possible. Come on. Oh, that reminds me there'll be a Dell video coming soon. I can't help myself. So, on the intake here, no, not the intake. So the power stroke there. So we've only got a power stroke that does 120 degrees. Well, a power stroke usually lasts about that, weirdly enough, because of port timing and so on and so forth. Um, because you start, some, some exhaust start opening the exhaust valves at this moment, so on. That's one thing. That's not the problem. The problem is here. So if we go from the in... Where does it say? Oh, for God's sake. Why are you messing up now? Start that again. Does it, it goes loopy there. So from... There we go. From 200 degrees is when the intake starts. So from 200 degrees to 265 degrees... So it's going to come down quite rapidly. We are only going down to there, 265 degrees. Well, this piston, we know before they clap and meet each other, if we go back to that bit, if we go back to this initial bit, there, uh, not there, there. So basically, the way this system works is that this piston meets this piston at 120 degrees, right, down the bore. But when you're on the intake stroke, and with inertial filling as well, is that you basically close your valves a lot later. So you pull basically 180 degrees worth of air. You are trying to fill your cylinder. Your volumetric efficiency requires 180 degrees even though you might have some overlap at the beginning, you make it up at the other end. So you are trying to use 120, 180 degrees worth of crank rotation, which is a full draw on your cylinder. The problem with this engine is 
is that it's pulled 120 degrees worth of volume in your cylinder. So what I did was, is, oh, fuck it, we don't need to see the spreadsheets. I took uh, the numbers of the R1, just one cylinder, and I basically took that and uh, looked at the graph of how much, actually, no, fuck it, I'll show you. Uh, how do I get out of this? It's that one, isn't it? So if I go to the, the oh whatever, fuck off. So if we go to here, I actually have piston cylinder volume. If you go to oh bloody hell, let's put all these numbers correct. Uh, stroke length, that's fifty point nine. There we go. If I you go through all of this, you go to cylinder volume. 120 degrees and degrees is on this side here. This is including the um, oh, this is including the uh, combustion chamber volume. You can see there, right there, the volume at 120 degrees in cc. I don't know if you can see that. Is 207. If we minus, it's about 200. So 120 degrees intake, it's about 200. It's a 250cc cylinder. So when you, um, so when you're doing this 120 degrees, you're basically missing out 50cc here, and this is 200cc. Well, that weirdly enough is 20%. So the reason why this engine is using 20% less fuel is because, let's just say it's a 250cc cylinder, it's using 25% 20 less fuel because it's taking in 20% less air, which means you'll get 20% less power. <laughs> which, <laughs> you know, it, it, it goes, you know, it, 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 that's per intake, if you get what I mean, if you put that less, the least amount of fuel in. So if you were comparing this two-stroke to a two-stroke, then you are going to get 20% less power. You know what I mean? That's not, that's just combustion, uh, just power from combustion. Forget all the other parts and stuff. Now, a lot of people in the comments to me posting this initial, I'm going to do this video, were saying stuff like, it's complicated, it's complex. Complex doesn't mean it's not going to work, and complex doesn't mean it's not a good idea. And I did some videos about what complexity actually means. The R1 crankshaft, the cross-plane crankshaft, is one part, just like a, Z a Honda crankshaft or a ZX7 crankshaft or whatever. It's one part, but the R1 crankshaft is more complex. It complicated. It's more complex. In other words, when you run that or when you go to design that, getting it balanced and all the other forces that are going on are more complicated. So the crankshaft is more complex. Um, you know, there's other things to consider. In other words, if you don't get that complex, the complexity correct, then you're going to end up with well, two halves of a crankshaft instead of just a crankshaft. Um, it's it, it, it's not as simple, uh, you know. And people say, "Oh, more parts equals shite." Well, no, because look at a Boeing 747. You can make planes a lot more, you know, a lot simpler. Um, complexity doesn't mean crap. Look at a 1969 Yamaha versus one today, or a 1972 Suzuki, uh, Suzuki Honda versus one today. If you have these two, the bike you have nowadays is a shitload more complicated than the 1972 version, and it's a lot faster, and it brakes a lot quicker, and it corners a lot better. It's just better. Complex complications and complexity do not mean crap. If you're raving about your two-stroke that you love so much, it'll have a power band. It'll have a power band. It'll have a power valve, and that power valve is a complexity built on the original design idea. You know, so don't think that complexity means crap or shite. You know, it doesn't. It's not as simple as that. This engine, it's a good crack, it has a lot of issues, and 
I'm going to now do some calculations on the crown because the crown accelerations mean nothing. It's how much force um, due to its mass that that generates and can this all hold on to it. One of the problems that I did see is when this thing flies up, is it going so fast when the cam launches it up? Is it going so fast and is the pressure great enough for it not to clap anything? You know, like a valve, because we have got the exhaust stroke when it's on its way up and that is one of the fastest accelerations. The valve is open, it's pushing up. Has it got enough um, momentum to clap into the top of the valve? Stuff like that. Now, I did do a tiny bit of research. It seems like this is one guy's idea. Um, looking at the pants and stuff, he calls it a company, but looks like this guy's on his Todd. It is quite pretty, you know what I mean? And it's, um, I have seen other versions. There actually is a guy who came up with a similar version to this, um, in a way. Uh, but that's NDA and stuff like that. But it, it's very much based on a similar principle to this. Um, I haven't even gone into the interaction between these two properly. Um, yeah, exactly. There's, a, there's quite a lot of things um, that could be problems with this. Like I say, I want to get this video out first where we just basically look at the general layout and the design and some of the design challenges then what I'm going to do is do some calculations and then what I'm going to do um, is doing the calculations see if we can design round it and then I'm going to build a CAD model um, with all these changes and I'm literally just going to take you through the thing like I say it's got issues but let's see if I can work out some ways around it stuff like that hope that makes sense um, you know, this is a different kind of format. I hope this worked out alright. And I'll see you in a bit.